Happy Independence Day, everybody. Hope you are having a good holiday. So in this video, I'm trying to, well, not trying to, it just worked out this way. It's kind of funny it happens on Independence Day, first of all, because I know a lot of people are looking forward to Ryan Cohen's uh, Teddy brand launching. And today's, uh, you know, has a, a trademark date and so forth, so that could be relevant. But I wanted to combine the idea of the recent series I started, which was why I'm confident investing in GameStop. Reason number one was the company has virtually no debt, like $26 million in French loans at like a 1% interest rate. Reason number two is they've got a ton of cash on hand, over a billion dollars, something like $1.4 billion altogether. So for me as a risk adverse investor, those two factors are huge. You're investing in a company with an extremely long runway, a lot of flexibility, and like not a lot of um, you know, ties on their direction or heading because you don't have debt that's controlled by maybe bondholders or banks or somebody else that can sabotage what your leadership is trying to do. So my third one, I was really grappling with all the different factors and there's a lot to think about with GameStop as this channel is kind of like demonstrated over the last year. But for me, I had to go with Ryan Cohen. So my third biggest reason to invest in GameStop or feel confident in my investment in GameStop is Ryan Cohen at the helm. But it's also a portion of the GameStop saga I've been wanting to talk about, the history of Ryan Cohen, uh, how he got involved with GameStop and what he's doing with the company. So it, it, fits out, it fits perfectly and it's on Independence Day, which I feel is really nice. So kind of a nice convergence of uh, coincidences there. So let's talk about Ryan Cohen and why he's so important. I want to mention right off the bat, I am not one at all for hero worship. I'm extremely um, con like considerate of the fact that people are individuals, people have their own motivations. And sometimes, you know, they might do things that you don't agree with. They might have viewpoints you don't agree with, um, but you got to put their actions first and consider what they what they've done or what they're doing as number one. And you know, you don't want to tether your horse necessarily to a person that's, you know, that could set you up for failure. So the fact that I'm putting a person as my number three, I thought about that a lot uh, because I'm not, I'm really not one at all to, to uh, hero worship or put anybody on a pedestal. But I want to talk about Ryan Cohen and how important he is to this story. And I've been wanting to for a long time. So this felt like a really good opportunity to bring the two ideas together. So here we go. We've got our story here and I've got the timeline. So I think I'll talk about the timeline of Ryan Cohen's involvement in GameStop first. So you can see back in uh, August, around August 18th of 2020, almost three years ago. All right. So here's about three years ago. We're approaching August again. Ryan Cohen began buying shares at GameStop during that early August period. And the stock has never been that low again. Not that, you know, it's directly related to the price of the stock. But he bought, at the time, it was about 6 million shares of GameStop, and then there's been a four for one split since then. So it's about 26 million, or um, you know, it would, it would grow to become 36 million shares by December, or uh, almost exactly 10% of the company. So he bought an enormous uh, stake in GameStop over these two or three months here, really about four months, at the end of 2020. He wrote a letter to the board announcing that he was an activist investor. And I've got a key quote from the letter right here. He wrote in that letter, GameStop's leadership should immediately conduct a strategic review of the business and share a credible plan for seizing the tremendous opportunities in the rapidly growing gaming sector. GameStop needs to evolve into a technology company that delights gamers and delivers exceptional digital experiences, not remain a video game retailer that over prioritizes its, its brick and mortar footprint and stumbles around the online ecosystem. He talked about a lot of different factors that we've discussed on this channel. The growing gaming segment, GameStop's like key position with over 56 million pros members and so forth, so or power up members. Uh, lots of different factors and the fact that GameStop was seeing declining revenue despite an inc increasing revenue base in gaming. So really this key portion back here where he bought in 10% of the company, wrote a letter to the board, and then on this particular date, very important date, January 11th, 2021, he would be named uh, chairman of the board of GameStop along with two other board seats. And since then he's you know got all the board seats, so there should be five now. They're all appointees of Ryan Cohen. So he essentially runs the entire company 
from an investor standpoint from the, from the board. And what's really important, I didn't put it on this graphic here, but he's been overseeing the capital allocation committee ever since this time. And there have been strategic moves that I want to talk about during this period that have set GameStop up for that strong foundation I talked about. So maybe now's the good, good time to do so. What happened was during this, not during this first run up in price, people will remember it went up to $480 pre-split or about $120 post-split. But on this subsequent run up in February and March, GameStop uh, sold shares on the open market, raising about a billion dollars in cash. And they sold another batch of shares during this run up here, raising about another billion dollars. I think altogether it was between one and a half and $2 billion in, in money raised. This was so important for the company because not only did it give them the cash on hand that they've got now, but they were able to pay off all of their outstanding debt during this period. So um, as the you know key member of the capital allocation committee, GameStop, or, uh, you know, GameStop was put on this position of you know cash positive and debt free by Ryan Cohen and being able to take advantage of what a lot of people call the sneeze of 2021. But you know, <laughs> it's it's almost impossible to even describe what a good financial move this was, considering the vast majority of us holding GameStop have not done anything nearly as good, right? GameStop bought back shares of its own stock back in 2018 or 2019 at you know about five dollars a share or so and then ended up selling them for over a hundred dollars a share over here that's an incredible move i think it was 195 dollars a share average um, pre-split so about 50 dollars a share post-split so to um you know buy back shares so cheap and then issue a, or sell out even a tiny fraction of those shares and raise almost two billion dollars to get rid of their debt position which was really the stranglehold on the company and put the company in such dire straits, they were really looking at going into chapter 11 probably and having to do maybe a dilution, just like BBBY and other companies are going through at this moment. All right, and they avoided all of that. So they threw off essentially the yoke of bad debt um, and and have able, been able to transform themselves by you know revitalizing the company, um, increasing their, their amount of inventory and their fulfillment uh, centers and so forth. So this entire year has about, been about using that um, that cash to transform the company. And those are things I do want to talk about, but it was really Ryan Cohen being at the helm that enabled number one and number two to even happen. Since then, what's happened, he's bought back into the company. When the stock hit a deep, deep low in March of last year, he bought in another 400,000 shares or about $10 million with the GameStop. And just recently after the Q1 results, he bought in another 444,000 shares, or again, another $10 million with the GameStop. And then most recently, just after the Q1 results, uh, Matt Furlong left the company and Ryan Cohen became the acting CEO. Uh, so that will give him you know, more work to do because he's chairman of the board and acting CEO. But that means that he's gonna be better positioned to directly influence the direction of the company and you know make this vision a reality. So things I'm particularly you know excited about with Ryan Cohen at the helm and having been at the helm for the last two and a half or so years is he's an entrepreneur. So for people that may not know, he didn't graduate from college. So kind of like a lot of the uh, you know great entrepreneurs of the past, he's got a you know working mindset and he's you know, contrarian by nature. His dad, he talks about all the time, which is kind of what his Teddy brand is all about and his books that he's written is all about, is about that work uh, ethic and willingness to roll up your sleeves and do the work. And I, personally, I really, really appreciate that. Um, as people have probably noticed on this channel, I'm a bit of a workaholic. I love doing things myself, like my yard, um, art, technology, teaching, um, my career all that kind of stuff. And I really, really enjoy um, seeing the products of your labor and not cutting any corners, just doing all the hard work. So for me, this is huge. I feel like with him, as he's talked about with the interview on GME DD, um, he's gonna you know, continue to work towards that legacy that his father instilled in him. And I, and I totally understand that. I think that's, that's a big one. The next one is, you know, he's really young. He's got young children and a family. So, you know, it's tough. I totally get that. 
but I do think that he's in the prime years. Um, and I know that for a bit there, because he went through the whole Chewy experience, I think he wanted to set down the load for a bit and let other people carry. Um, but, you know, I think that there is a drive in people to work hard, especially people of this mindset. And this is a good age to work really, really hard and see the fruits of your labor. So being young, I think is really important. The Chewy experience, he started Chewy from the ground up. Um, for those not familiar, you can read interviews with him that he did a couple years ago about the Chewy experience. At first he wanted to go into like a jewelry business and initially was like piloting that idea. And then he decided, you know what, I'm really passionate about my, uh, he's got a dog and you know, animals and all that kind of stuff. So he was like, you got to do what you're passionate about. And I'm, I'm huge on that. When you, when you love what you're doing, it doesn't feel like work. <laughs> even as a workaholic. In fact, it can be almost dangerous because you can just work, 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 work if you really love it. So um, he was passionate about pets and so forth. And so they switched over from jewelry stuff to pet stuff, launched the company, ran it for seven years as CEO um, and you know sold it for billions of dollars. So that's a huge success story. He uh, took on key players like Amazon in the pet food business. And it was really that customer experience that drove all this. And I want to see GameStop have a similar um, customer focused mindset to make it so that people want to be GameStop customers for life. Uh, another key aspect is he's talked about his relationship with capital and how when he takes, you know, other people's money to make his ideas work, like Larry Chang and Volition Capital to make Chewy work, that, that made him work hard because he knows that that, that those people's money are you know an investment in him and an investment in his work and i think that um, he's spoken and the leadership of the company has spoken directly to shareholders with him as the uh, chairman um, that they appreciate the shareholder interest enthusiasm and investment and i think that that's a big driver for me because i know that he values the fact that i'm invested in the company and i don't think that he'll squander my resources other companies in Wall Street, I don't have, don't think have that same mindset. And I think we're seeing um, incredible stewardship over investor um, capital. And I think that that is from his father's legacy and his belief and mindset. Um, I don't know if he still has a big stake in Apple. I think he does. But, you know, as a billionaire, which is important, he's got capital behind him. He's got a huge stake in Apple, one of the largest, I believe. And Apple is at like an all-time high right now. So he's <laughs> done well with his Chewy money, investing in Apple, I believe also in Alibaba and Nordstrom. But I, I don't know his up-to-date financials or anything like that. But it just goes to show you that he's got a lot of capital at hand. He's, he's not you know, at risk of selling his position for need of money, I would say. That makes me more confident. In fact, he's got more money with which to invest down the road as he's done in recent times. Um, and then so he's got a 12.9% stake in GameStop. He initially bought 10% of the company. That's basically the limit as an activist investor. He's got an agreement with the company that he could buy up to 20%. So he can still buy another 7% of the company. That's huge because you can see that every time he buys into the company, you know, the floor rises with his purchases. And I think that he's essentially showing with his willingness to buy in that we have nothing to fear as, as investors because he's got this. I mean, if he buys another 7% stake in the company, the, the stock will have to rise. We can see with his most recent purchase, almost every single one of these shares that he purchased were failed to deliver, all right? And what happened back with his buys in, in late 2020 was these were all similarly failed to deliver, I'm sure, causing huge pressure and probably kicking off a lot of the cyclical behavior that we've talked about on this channel. So just with one person at our back, because it doesn't seem like we've got many other people um, willing to buy into GameStop except for, you know, allies or board appointments like Larry Chang and Atal. Um, you know, he can pressure the stock individually where we don't seem to have that same kind of pressure. All right. And so currently he's our uh, chairman of the board and acting CEO of the company. I wanted to mention and kind of already have that, you know, I like the fact that he's got a vision for GameStop. He articulated it very well in his letter. This is similarly worded to um, Michael Burry's letter, which I've talked about, and Sky on Capital's letters before them. So uh, I feel like when he is, um, you know, vision mindsetted, <laughs> that's the word, and he's, he's not happy with where things are at with the vision, 
he's willing to, to act and do things that other people might not be willing to do, like, for example, potentially letting Matt Furlong go. Um, maybe others, you know, I think a lot of people have hypothesized that um, our former CFO was let go for that reason, maybe even our former um, COO, uh, maybe our former CEO in Sherman as well. Um, I know that he's mentioned in the GMETD video that every detail matters. I totally get that. You guys can probably see that in the channel, but also just with the larger super stonk community, we uh, analyze every single detail, every single thing. We've gone through the 10 Qs and 10 Ks with a fine tooth comb, and we're just committed to this company, committed to this investment. We are not YOLOing, you know, like mindless drones. We are extremely con like discerning about every single fact of the matter. And I know that he gets that. And I think he probably follows along with what we're following along with and is looking at every detail very carefully as well. So um, I've mentioned his work mentality. He said in that same interview that he didn't want to be CEO because he didn't want to work himself to death. Now he's found himself in that position. And I'm excited to see what he's going to do when it comes to things like the technology play and customer service. I think that both of those, along with uh, powering up the GameStop brand, and we can already see that with the pros membership changing, all those things are going to be huge to changing where GameStop is in the uh, gaming ecosystem. I really appreciate this one. I'm a natural contrarian. I think a lot of people are learning to be through the GameStop saga. They're starting to learn to question the media, question the narrative, and I would encourage people to continue to do so. And that's everything. So I appreciate in the community, people will regularly post something and other people say, nope, that's not, you know, that's not true. And they'll downvote it or, you know, mods will remove it or whatever. That's important. You don't want to find yourself in a groupthink mentality at any point, right? So he's got that natural contrarian mindset. And I think that that's extremely important in a leader. And he's got a clear anti-Wall Street sentiment. He talks about it all the time. He's huge about leaders putting in their own capital, not just getting you know huge compensation in cash or shares from shareholders, because that's where it ultimately comes from. And he feels a huge alignment with us shareholders. That's I can't speak enough for this because any other investment you're going to see regularly in Wall Street, uh, CEOs and other corporate you know um, leadership positions getting extremely big compensation. And then where do you actually see them doing anything or, you know, committing to a vision and then getting that vision done? It's like they usually come in, talk a big game, maybe start some stuff, get paid out a whole bunch and leave before stuff really hits the fan. And those those initiatives they start could die on the vine or even work out, you know, for the worst, if whether they're acquisitions or selling off, you know, parts of the company and the effect on their leadership on the stock price, ultimately, very rarely positive. So to have somebody, you know, aligned with shareholders, having bought every single share himself, taking no compensation, <laughs> I didn't even mention that, as chairman and as a CEO, I can't speak enough for that. That is a uh, servant leader to a T. And um, I got to say that that really is great. And the fact that Others on the board, not the entire board and not the ex entire exec suite is similarly aligned is huge. I'd like to see all five members of the board buy stock as well. And I would also like to see our COO and CFO buy shares of the company. I know we've seen our general manager pick up shares. Uh, they were compensation, but I think the shares that he had previously were his own. But if the entire leadership team is committed to buying shares and potentially DRSing them, that says a lot for investors. I think I, it would be a one in a million company to have that form of leadership. Kind of speaks to the second or this next point here, his personal capital base and his network of capital, um, meaning like Volition Capital, Larry Chang and others is huge. Uh, it goes to show you that he's got people that believe in him and his potential to do work and create uh, something out of a vision. So, you know, we're basically attaching our hitch to that. And I feel confident in that team. The last one I want to say is the fact that the media hates him is good to me. I, I have learned over this saga to not trust basically anything the media says. It's all corporate propaganda and the corporations do not like 
uh, the disruptive role that GameStop and Ryan Cohen are playing in this market. And so the fact that the media is constantly maligning him and attacking him and he doesn't do any interviews with with uh, the media and they put out like, for example, um, the what was it like expose or documentary where they didn't even interview anyone close to him, but they would just say, you know, people familiar with Ryan Cohen. <laughs> I love that. Like this guy is um, making enemies and seemingly unafraid. And, you know, it's going to drive him. I can I can sort of imagine it would drive him and put a chip on his shoulder to have you know, been so successful making a multi-billion dollar company from scratch and now turning GameStop around and creating, you know, first cash flow positivity, then positive EPS and $150 million year over year improvement in this most recent two quarters. Um, to do all of that and get nothing but flack in the media uh, says a lot to me. So, um, you know, I naturally just take what the media says and invert it. <laughs> so it's another signal for me to believe in Ryan Cohen. So again, um, this is episode five of the GameStop saga. I'm glad to return to um, to this, uh, this sort of part of the channel. It's also my number three reason to believe in my investment in GameStop. And again, I'm not a um, hero worshiper ever. I'm typically very, very um, discerning about who I'm going to follow or believe in. And um, Ryan Cohen has stood the, the test of the last three years. Everything he's done for me has shown that he's a like a true spirit, somebody that's true to himself. Um, and I'm a big believer in that because sometimes you have to take risks. Sometimes you have to take an unpopular opinion. And he seems willing to do that if he believes in it. And you have to have that kind of confidence and willingness to put things on the line. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Looking forward to doing more videos um, in the saga of GameStop because there's so much to tell and it's sort of non-linear. And I hope you guys have a great Independence Day. And we're going to see what happens with Teddy, <laughs> hopefully soon, and BBBY, I think, in the coming weeks here. I know people have asked me to talk about it, but I'm as confused as anyone else on that one. And if Ryan Cohen is still involved, that would be pretty exciting. So I will see you guys in the next video. Have a great day.